Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Kurt Hoffmeister, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Uh, I've probably been attending this conference for more than 20 years, and uh, I hope that any of you who are new to the conference find as many good uh, references and uh, contacts and experiences as I have enjoyed. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm probably going to use the word visualization a lot. So I'll start with this slide and say that um, for me, early in my career as an engineer, I read somewhere that more than 40% of our brain is dedicated to visual processing. And my takeaway there was that in my career, I thought it'd be important to always try to use visualization whenever possible to get, a pro get across a result or a, a point or for communication. So my background is mechanical engineering. And I actually started work at the Michelin Tire Company. And so people who know that often ask me, how did you transition from tires to virtual reality? Well, if, if you're an engineer, a tire is a really interesting structure of composite materials, tension, compression, and so on. And if you've heard of the Michelin Tire Company, they're more than 100 years old and pretty conservative company. So I started there in a role where I was creating software for design and analysis. And uh, the traditional way of doing things was to just bury the results in two-dimensional plots, line, line plots that were mind-numbing for someone who was interested in visualization. So uh, my contribution at that time was to take some of this design and analysis and test results and just simply start by visualizing it on the tire, not jumping straight to 2D plots. And that was a huge impact. It was a pretty easy way to shorten a meeting by showing one result was clearly better than another and not debating the nuance of how much separation there was in a simple plot. Well, after about 10 years there, I decided I really wanted to go further in my career in looking for ways to apply visualization. And so uh, I ended up at Iowa State University at somewhere called the Iowa Center for Emerging Manufacturing Technology. Uh, there were several faculty there who were also mechanical engineers, but the emphasis at that center was heavy on visualization. So I pretty quickly made a transition from doing a, a graphics to maybe higher end simulation in virtual reality. Uh, now, one of the things that was um, a revelation to me at the time was an early head mounted display called the Boom. This uh, device, the binocular omni oriented monitor was in many respects ahead of its time. High resolution CRT monitor. And this uh, monitor that you could strap to your head or hold up as you looked into it uh, was weightless. It was very perfectly counterbalanced uh, by this mechanical arm. So of course it had some inertia, but it was weightless to hold up to your head. For me, this was a real aha moment because now you could be inside the visualization. I know virtual reality is more ubiquitous today, but this time it, that, was, that was quite new. And I would even argue this device, uh, sadly no longer available, still has advantages or at least rivals some of the HMDs available today. Uh, this mechanical arm provided all the tracking of where that head-mounted display was positioned and oriented. And not just tracking, but at a high degree of precision and with very low latency. Early head-mounted displays, people often complained about latency, but there was certainly none in the tracking for this system. So if, at the same time, um, the center there had a projection screen display that was 3D capable, and you could bring out tracking equipment and do a full simulation, 
But once again, you're in front of that screen like a window to a virtual world, but you're really not in there inside the data. You're kind of outside looking in. Maybe some of the 3D content came out. But it's a little bit frustrating to me that typically, you know, even with a group in front of the screen or some kind of a class setting, oftentimes the content shown was pre-rendered and is set up for a fixed head position somewhere in the center of the viewing audience. So once again, it really wasn't fully immersive um, multi-viewer type simulation, even though several people would be looking at it at the same time. So this would have been around 1994, 95. Uh, there was a lot of buzz going on about something called the cave. And Iowa State University decided they were gonna build a cave. Uh, this is a, round, a surround screen virtual reality system that you can actually stand on the floor and have graphics projected all around you. As part of doing this, Iowa State was fortunate enough to recruit uh, Dr. Carolina Cruz Nira, one of the inventors of the original cave at University of Illinois, Chicago. So having her on board was huge, and I had the privilege of working with her to design and build and then manage a cave facility there at Iowa State University. So the opportunity to uh, learn the system inside and out, uh, maintain one, be that good or bad, and uh, be familiar with the software that operated on it uh, was a huge opportunity. It was oftentimes promoted as uh, something that would be a group experience. And that's a little bit misleading. We did tour after tour after tour with uh, small groups of people in the system. But really, just like a head mounted display, everything being drawn here was for a single head position. And I'll, I'll come back to that point. But uh, around this time, um, myself and uh, two of my uh, colleagues there at the university started a company we called Mechdyne. And uh, our original intent was to do visualization and consulting and even some software development all around this kind of new area of simulation and virtual reality. Um, but what quickly happened was we realized there was a bigger demand for display system hardware. And so we kind of transitioned from a developer to a systems integrator where we would build caves and what we called power walls and workbenches and just a variety of uh, those type of more immersive displays. Now, uh, since that time, Mechdyne has grown and acquired some other companies, but I'd say our core emphasis has still remained 3D and branched into audio, video, and uh, IT type applications. So a uh, little bit of history kind of back up for a second. This device called the Cave was invented at um, University of Illinois Chicago, the Electronic Visualization Lab in 1992. And they actually licensed it to a company called Pyramid Systems who began uh, commercially building caves with their help. Uh, early customers like General Motors and other universities. Um, this company, Pyramid Systems, was actually acquired, I mean, Pyramid Systems was acquired by Fake Space Systems, which had been spun out of Fake Space Incorporated, the company that built that original boom. So uh, fast forward a little bit, probably around uh, 2003, uh, Mechdyne had been going strong and competing with Fake Space, and we actually acquired this company, Fake Space. So at that time, we also acquired the licensing rights to the word CAVE and the CAVE system, which was trademarked by the University of Illinois. Um, there was also another company out there called VRCO, and they had licensed the CAVE library. That was the main software at the time to uh, drive a CAVE-type system. So Mechdyne acquired VRCO as well, and at this point, we were the primary provider of uh, caves and the software to run them. Although the industry and the 
the market and the research, everything was developing pretty quickly, such that um, uh, the CAVE was not, CAVE libraries wasn't the only software uh, by any means that you would use to drive such a system. Even so, uh, uh, fast forward even to today, MEC9 still pays University of Illinois, Chicago, a very, very minor <laughs> uh, royalty out of goodwill and uh, respect for the history of that, that name and our shared relationship. Um, if there's a takeaway here, uh, MEC9 is still interested in new developments and looking for opportunities to license such things. Um, University of Illinois developed something called the Cave 2, maybe eight years ago now. Yeah, it's been presented here at this conference. Something else MacDyne chose to uh, license from the university. Uh, some of the air companies we've acquired along the way, uh, this company does AV design for um, oh, hospitals, schools, office buildings, things like that. Uh, an air company that does IT services uh, that kind of fit real well with the audio video services we we're already doing. And then uh, a company that builds visualization uh, structures and mounting solutions. So again, as the company's grown and, and done acquisitions, they all kind of fit toward this um, integrating and delivering display solutions. Okay, so back to multi-viewer systems. If you've heard of a cave before, you perhaps read an article that talked about it as the holodeck. Um, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this over the year. And it's usually a comp, uh, accompanied by a picture, something like this, a group of people in the cave. A cave is typically 10 foot by 10 foot, so to have six or seven people in there is getting a little bit crowded. And, and keep in mind, everything that's displayed is for a single head position. Uh, I just realized there's a couple of people in this picture I don't think are even wearing glasses. So it's, it's definitely a marketing picture of what's going on in the cave. Uh, if we think about what it takes to do a virtual reality display, uh, the fundamental things are some kind of a compute, of course all the software drivers, application content that goes with that, and then very important body tracking, at least the head position, if not hands, arms, other parts of your body, and some, some means of interaction. Uh, all that gets shown in immersive display, and, and really when you come right down to it, it's all being shown for a single head position. Doesn't really matter if it's a head mount display or a multi-screen type display. Everything that kind of drives that isn't too different. Uh, today, it's very common that someone would use the Unity game engine to drive a virtual reality application. And for the most part, application running on HMD could just easily run a cave, vice versa. They're, they're still just an immersive display of some sort. And again, they're really set up to be a uh, singer, single viewer uh, head position um, what I'd like to do here is run a short video and um, see if I can uh, launch this. Can I have uh, audio? Oh, it's not showing up above. Okay. Just gonna drag it over. I'm Matt Samatsky of MacDyne, and I'm here today to talk about a very important aspect of virtual reality, viewer-centered perspective. What is viewer-centered perspective? It's the view we see of the real world based upon the position and orientation of our eyes in space. For example, in the real world, if I wanted to see underneath this desk, I would simply bend down and look underneath it. 
But if this were a computer-generated world, like the one on the monitor behind me, no matter how I change my perspective, the view stays the same. That's because the software has its own camera or perspective point. If I wanted to change the view, I have to use my mouse and move the scene around. In this case, instead of me moving my perspective around the world, I'm changing the model's position and orientation within the software. In virtual reality, the viewing paradigm has changed. Imagine this picture frame as though it were a display system. Without viewer-centered perspective, the image stays the same. No matter how I change my viewpoint, I always see the same image. But when I add viewer-centered perspective through tracking, the picture frame really becomes a portal into the virtual world. Now, wherever I move the frame, I see more or less of the world behind it. This is what viewer-centered perspective provides. By changing your view relative to the screen, you see different aspects or angles of the environment. By using a larger portal or a larger display system, you can see more or less of the world. In order for the VR software to create the viewer-centered perspective, it must know the user's position and orientation in space. That's accomplished through the use of the tracking system. The tracking system has several infrared cameras that pick up reflective markers attached to the user's glasses. That position and orientation is then calculated by the tracking system and provided to the VR software. The VR software then uses that to create the viewer-centered perspective. Without tracking or viewer-centered perspective, the large display behind me acts like a large monitor. No matter if I move side to side or up or down, in or out, the image doesn't change. Now, with tracking turned on, when I wear the glasses, the view perspective changes based upon my position and orientation in space. If I wanted to see underneath the desk, all I would have to do is bend down. If I wanted to see more of the left of the desk kiosk, all I have to do is step to the right. Here in a view of a turbine, as we move closer to the screen, the more of the world we can see. In fact, we can even see into the cutaway behind it. The screen is acting like a large window or portal into the virtual world. The bigger the window, or more screens there are, the more of the virtual object we can see at any one time. Viewer-centered perspective is a very valuable capability. It allows a user to view a virtual part, plant, assembly, city, or more in a way that's simple and intuitive, because it's the same way we view the real world, by simply moving our heads. It is this intuitive viewing that is so powerful to the user, because it allows them to understand spatial relationship and dimensions in a way much more easily than on the flat monitor screen. It could allow users to make design decisions, walk through a virtual plant, plan a surgical procedure, or understand the best way to service heavy equipment. Slide 11. Okay. So I I wish uh, I wish I had, had access to this uh, video when I was first learning because this is one of those things that I knew from working with a cave that viewer-centered perspective was critical. But I didn't really know it, and I learned a hard lesson was after we'd built this system and we had it running, I couldn't wait to show my wife. And she's a good sport, and I brought her in there, and I put glasses on her, and I put the head tracking on me. And I immediately began to navigate through the system. I'm standing there. Uh, I'm animated. I'm also turning and talking to her. And it was about less than a minute when she started turn green and she's like, I'm out. <laughs> and uh, it was a long time before I could get her in a system like that again. Uh, because viewer center perspective is calculating a right eye, left eye view based on my head position and which direction I'm looking, every time I turned to talk to her, the screen she was looking at, the stereo separation would go to zero. Or if I, if I turned around far enough, the stereo separation would reverse. Plus, every time I moved to the right to, to point something out, the entire uh, visualization would skew to the left because my position had changed. And yet she was standing there trying not to be sick. So I learned a really hard lesson. 
And uh, from that point on, when we were doing demonstrations in a cave system, uh, many times I would hold the glasses while I was talking to the couple of people in there with me. Or I would early on offer them to someone but encourage them to initially stand still uh, and try and help people understand what was going on. Everyone in there is sharing that one point of view. And if that point of view moves, the person wearing the head tracking feels like they're walking around an object. But everyone else uh, suffers based on how quickly they're moving and how tolerant they are of that unexpected uh, uh, perspective shift. Now also, if you look at uh, any literature or uh, promotional materials for, um, for these type of displays, you'll see pictures like the two I have here. Um, whoops, uh, too fast. Uh, so you may have noticed in that video, uh, none of the splays behind Matt were stereoscopic, even though he was being head tracked. That's a pretty common technique. And this picture here, uh, the head tracking is actually on the camera that took the picture. And so we see this cupola and the architecture uh, in the corner of the cave system has a 3D appearance because it is from the camera's point of view. Whereas these two people who are wearing glasses looking at a monoscopic image <laughs> also are nowhere near the camera location. So uh, everything they see is going to be skewed and uh, uh, folded or bent, if you will, where it crosses from one screen to the other. It's not going to be continuous. Uh, the other thing I, I always cringe when I see is a small group of people in a cave, uh, all in different viewing positions, and someone pointing at an object. You know, once again, if you're head tracked and you point at an object, it makes perfect sense. But someone who's sharing your point of view and yet standing a little bit away from you can't always tell what you're pointing at because, again, they're, they're sharing your perspective, but it's skewed. It just doesn't work out. Uh, so this question about multiple viewer stereoscopic displays, they're all around us. Movie theaters and our theater session last night are real good examples of that. Um, and so you have a large group of people sharing a single point of view. In this case, the audience uh, may be convinced they're immersed. Something's probably coming out of the screen at them. Um, but again, they're all sharing that one point of view. So people further away from the center probably have a less ideal view from the people uh, uh, right in the sweet spot of that display. Everything is not only one perspective, but it's for a fixed eye point. So the ideal here would be, how do we accommodate multiple viewers and not share a single perspective? In other words, every viewer or every eye should see a correct perspective for that position and the direction they're looking. That's kind of a key requirement for a true multi-viewer system. Uh, some of the other uh, motivations here would be if uh, people are trying to work together, they're co-located. Um, They'll be in close proximity to each other, but they're still going to have inaccuracy if they're trying to share a viewpoint, especially if they're doing a collaborative task. Um, the more accurate each person's view is, the more naturally they can point, discuss, move around the object without impacting anyone else. It's, it's always correct for them. It also simplifies body awareness. Uh, with a head mount display, you might need to include something like an avatar of each person, uh, whereas in a system like, like I'm talking about with just glasses, you can see your colleagues, you can see your own hands, you're not going to uh, accidentally bump into somebody that you could see was right there beside you. Uh, it reminds me of uh, a paper that was presented here three years ago. I think Andrew actually gave the talk. Uh, this is a great reference that I, I think does a real nice job of summing up some of the errors. Uh, the title here was uh, Display Without Head Tracking, but you could read the paper thinking, okay, if this point of view is, is for a head tracked user, in other words, correct for this position, and someone standing to their left is looking at the same images on the screen, there's going to be a perceived error in what they see. 
And to me, that error gets worse for objects that seem to come out of the screen uh, to the point that it's really hard to uh, point and interact or even comfortably look at anything with negative parallax coming out of the screen. So there's been uh, many attempts over the years to do multi-viewer displays. Um, one of the early ones that I think uh, was well printed, funded by NASA, and uh, you can still find online today, was this uh, dual viewer immersive workbench. It's a large projection table, and it was set up so two people would each have correct perspective in order to do a collaborative task. Uh, this paper is one of the early ones I could find that did a nice job of, of describing you know, what, what was happening in pretty simple terms. The viewer on the left can see the left side of the cube. The viewer on the right can see the right side of the cube, even though they're looking at the same object. Unfortunately, if, if this were a single viewer system and the person on the left could only share the perspective of the person on the right, they would see something that was quite skewed. And if they tried to point or even reach and touch the virtual object, it'd be nowhere near the same position on that object that the viewer on the right would perceive. So that type of collaboration just wasn't gonna happen. A uh, few things about this, it, it, it was new at the time, but it wasn't a huge stretch to accomplish. Um, uh, at the time, CRT projectors had this uh, interesting trait. You could reduce resolution and run them at a higher refresh rate in many cases. Um, so there's one projector running at a pretty high refresh rate, uh, closer to 140 hertz, above 120. Um, there were also other approaches using two projectors and polarization. Oftentimes, uh, Custom glasses were required. But in the end, uh, what was really important was they were co-located, having a correct view, and um, that view allowed them to interact naturally. One key thing was having uh, glasses. I, I love these because they're, um, you know, John Lennon or Harry Potter type glasses. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll attempt to put them on here, but... Um, you can see they don't fit my glasses real well, and they're quite small. But what's unique about them compared to other active shutter glasses available at the time, uh, most shutter glasses are a twisted pneumatic liquid crystal shutter. And um, rather than go into the details about this, this is a ferroelectric shutter. It requires more power but it drives much faster rate and also um, uh, has really good contrast between the open and closed state. So it was plugged into a serial port with a driver that allowed it to shutter right eye, left eye for two viewers, four eyes in rapid succession. It was what really made this, this table work. Now, since that time, uh, there's been several other um, projects, research projects, uh, often presented here. Um, uh, Baron Frolic has uh, presented or his work or one of his colleagues has presented here several times. Uh, things like uh, four projectors and uh, again, custom drive for the uh, glasses. This would be the, instead of one projector at a real high refresh rate, uh, where you're time sequencing what's coming out of the projector. Uh, here using one projector per eye, but you're still time sequencing the glasses. So you're only seeing with one eye at a time. Uh, even so, it's possible then to do correct view for two viewers anyway. Um, variations on this uh, have used four, six, even more projectors. If you, uh, if you look into a project like this that is using uh, shuttered projectors or um, whether it's mechanical or LCD type shuttering, um, or perhaps it uses pulsed light into the projector, 
uh, the paper's probably going to reference this patent by Dr. Kerry Povari from um, Tampere University in Finland. Um, Mechdyne actually, pat uh, actually licensed this patent and created a product we called Beacon that used a pair of LCD projectors to do active stereo display. Uh, the reason we did that was when 4K projectors first came on the market, uh, there was no active stereo 4K projector. You could use two of them and do passive stereo, but for situations where um, passive polarization wasn't ideal, we could use the shutter on the projector and create an active stereo display. Um, fast forwarding a little bit, there, there were other variations of this supporting uh, three, four, even six viewers. Uh, typically, a projector per eye. Uh, I think this one used a combination of a mechanical shutter in front of the projector and then polarization. So as this pair of projectors were showing right eye, left eye for the first user, polarization actually did the separation between the eyes. As the mechanical shutter uh, blocked the other projectors, the liquid crystal and the glasses blocked the other viewers. But again, it could all be synchronized in time such that every person would see their own correct stereoscopic view. Uh, in 2013, I did a presentation here on evaluating stereoscopic glasses, the active shutter type glasses. And uh, uh, the key thing here is if you're doing 120 hertz stereo, each eye has roughly an eight millisecond cycle. And with a photodiode, you can actually see the lens open and then the time that it's at its maximum transparency. So this type of uh, glasses has a pretty good uh, response time during which it's, it's opening. In other words, if you have no voltage on the glasses, its natural state is transparent. You apply a voltage and it goes opaque, so that eye is closed. And then you remove that voltage and it takes some time for the uh, liquid shuttle, shutter to relax and open back up. So if, if this is an um, eight millisecond cycle that that eye is open, it's really only open for on the order of six uh, milliseconds. So uh, right eye, left eye sequence might be 16 milliseconds total for 120 hertz uh, refresh rate. Your eye is open for six seconds and then closed for the next uh, 10 milliseconds. So that type of cycle time really uh, starts to impact the brightness. Um, I'll come back to that in just a, a second with the last point on this slide. Uh, Mechdyne was asked to deliver a, a dual view cave to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, this was actually a six-sided cave set up with a digital projector, digital per DLP projectors. <laughs> um, and what was easy about this installation, if you will, was these projectors had a feature called dual pipe. It was intended that you'd provide video for the right eye at 60 hertz, video for the left eye at 60 hertz, and internally the projector would alter those frames and produce a 120 hertz stereo image. But this projector could actually run up to 144 hertz. So we did a 72 hertz input to each of these uh, input pipes. And the first input was right eye, left eye for one viewer. The second input was right eye, left eye for a second viewer. So the projector alternated between all four eye images at uh, 36 hertz per eye. Uh, I very quickly learned about a, a phenomenon called critical flicker fusion frequency. Um, and the research on this was done long ago and it's still relevant today. Uh, there is a threshold where if um, the flicker is not fast enough, uh, you will easily perceive it and the brighter the image, the more easy it is to perceive. 
there's also then effects about, well, what is the difference between how bright is bright and how dark is dark? And what is the dwell time between these two states? Uh, I mentioned before with a single viewer pair of glasses, the eye is open for roughly six milliseconds and closed for 10. So if you take that cycle and you break it in half, the end result is the eye is now open for roughly two milliseconds and closed for 14 as the other three eyes are open and closed. So your threshold for starting to perceive flicker is, is right on the ragged edge. Most people would say it was fine, but there were certainly people who would perceive some flicker, uh, especially if they were clued in to look for it with this type of display. So that was uh, delivered to university um, there in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I should have checked before the presentation. I don't know if it's still in use, but this probably would have been around 2006, 2007 um, that that was put into operation. So let's, let's go back to this idea of uh, multiple viewers with correct viewpoint. Uh, people often ask me about the CAVE-2 system. So uh, with a CAVE-2, it is a large cylindrical display and uh, uh, you often see multiple people in the system. And you wonder, well, how, how does that work because of the airs? Uh, it takes advantage of something called panoptic or omnidirectional stereo. Uh, the, the 3D may be computed for a head position at the center of the cylinder. Often this head position is fixed. But the direction of view is not fixed. So each column of the display is rendered as if the head were facing that column and then the next column. And if the cylinder is large enough or segmented small enough, the air between columns isn't really noticeable. And uh, this works quite well. Anybody in the system, uh, preferably closer to the center, has a pretty comfortable stereo view regardless of which direction they're facing. And, and, and you can still head track somebody within this space. So uh, again, it's, it's multiple viewers sharing kind of the same head position, but at least it's adjusted to be correct for each column of the display. So as people are facing each other, talking and looking at the display, each behind the other, uh, you see a correct view. It turns out that uh, uh, simulators, uh, this one is a training simulator, have, have used this technique for quite some time. In, in general, this, this system here is like uh, 24 screens uh, with uh, a pod on each end that's maybe 25 foot diameter. So when you're in this pod, uh, it's using omnidirectional stereo and the screens are primarily uh, environment. In other words, they're doing co uh, communication, they might be doing a Corman procedure on a mannequin. Um, but there are plenty of tracked objects in this space, especially weapons. Uh, so s some of the team might be doing firefighting with the virtual environment, but there's not a lot of other interaction with the environment. It's, it's more there for the atmosphere and the training. So again, it's making use of this omni-stereo approach. Um, so I, I probably should speed up here a little bit. Uh, one, one solution that I think uh, works really well for small groups is a volumetric display. Uh, no glasses required. Uh, Greg's our resident expert on volumetric display. Um, although these things may tend to be smaller, almost desktop type uh, solutions, they don't have to be. It's just that everyone who views and interacts with it is still uh, on the outside looking in, if you will. Um, so again, based on limitation for the size, you still could have several people comfortably viewing uh, virtual objects in this type of display. Uh, another approach that's been around and talked about quite a bit is auto stereo, uh, particularly lenticular displays, and we've seen some mention of that yesterday and today. Um, it's possible to uh, render out a light field after passing through lenticular 
that supports multiple viewpoints. If you arrange that in a cylinder type display, large enough for a few people, uh, everyone would have a comfortable view, especially if they are in the appropriate viewing zone uh, for the display surrounding them. So what I mean by that is, uh, and this is really a gross generalization, but I think the weakness of this type of approach is if you're not in the designed viewing area, too close, too far back, too far off to one side, you'll start to see a repetition of a view that's not correct for your position. Uh, you'll see crosstalk uh, between views, and you may even see a reversal of stereo depending on the type system. So uh, this is something that still is rendering a light field. So ideally, anyone within here would have a comfortable stereo view of the screens in front of them uh, without glasses and without the need to head track each viewer. It's just generating a field of light correct for all those viewing positions within. Uh, the Nirvana that we all have talked about for, what, 30 years now, is a uh, holographic display. Um, and I do like this uh, quote from Stephen Benton that um, uh, he's credited with inventing uh, one of the first holographic video systems but he was also often heard to say, you know, we're just three Nobel Prizes away from a practical solution. Uh, I, I hear the term uh, holographic applied to anything with a diffraction grating in it. I'd, I'd, I'd love to debate at one point or another, but there's constantly promising developments as well. Um, this company, Zebra Imaging, uh, unfortunately is bought out and no longer around. Uh, I did see their prototype with an array of hoggles that generated, uh, I think it was uh, 1,024 views um, out of that single hoggle and then a small array of those. So in table format, you could walk around this table and uh, have correct view for any position around the table. Uh, it was a prototype and limited, but uh, still very interesting. Now uh, Euclidean Holographics is giving a talk, is it uh, tomorrow afternoon, I think. Um, they advertise tables, walls, and rooms using their technology, and I'm looking very forward to learning more about that. Again, ideally, if you're rendering a light field, um, anybody in that light field should have a comfortable, natural, stereoscopic view of the virtual uh, images being projected for them. Uh, last thing I wanted to touch on is, well, uh, no, I have a couple more things, but I'm, I'm very optimistic about video see-through head mount displays. Uh, again, I think we have a talk tomorrow uh, more on this subject, but uh, this allows you to mix virtual objects with real world. Uh, in my opinion, it requires some AI or logic to decide what to filter out of the real world in order to show um, virtual objects. If I were sitting at a table, I wouldn't need to see my legs. If I were operating an airplane, I might want to be able to look down and see the pedals and, and things below me. So if you're mixing, uh, there needs to be some logic or some ability to scan yourself, as we saw in an earlier presentation, and incorporate that into the virtual environment. So if I, if I leave you with one takeaway, and that is the question was the best, there is no single best solution. Uh, there's certainly a wide variety of solutions with pros and cons. Um, I'd encourage you to consider your application and uh, think about what might work best for, for what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, one thing I'm excited about that I've been working with for the last year is a new projector from the company Digital Projection. Uh, this is a 4K resolution, 360 hertz refresh projector, very high frame rate projector. Uh, because of that, and because of its blightness, it can be driven with six inputs or uh, support one to three stereoscopic perspectives. So it's a, 
a single projector capable of supporting three viewers uh, with stereoscopic display. A pair of projectors uh, could even do six viewers using a polarization to separate those. Um, these projectors are pretty interesting. Uh, that's nothing different here from what we saw 10 years ago. It still is uh, cycling right eye, left eye images for the three viewers, and the glasses have to cooperate. What I think is maybe underbilled in the development of this high frame rate projector is, oops, is the glasses. Uh, there was a paper here in 2012 talking about glasses for very high refresh rate uh, applications, whether it was a single viewer to very high refresh rate or multiple viewers time sharing that refresh rate. And a very simple solution here that Volfoni has implemented, it uses uh, two lenses stacked together. One is naturally white or naturally transparent until voltage is applied. The other is naturally opaque and becomes transparent when a voltage is applied. So by stacking these and driving them alternately, you can get a very square wave response. You don't lose some of your image time to the transition of the lenses. Uh, so that development, I think, is what really makes this projector uh, a nice solution. And so uh, that's one of the things I've seen most, uh, most recently, that as a systems integrator, I'm already prepared to develop and, I mean, to deliver and have been demonstrating its commercially available product. Anybody wants to know more, I can uh, tell them about that, but uh, I'd also take in uh, any questions.